Hello, Catherine, as well. Thank you for being our first official guest. Um, we're so excited to get to know you a little bit better and, and learn from some of the stories that you share with us. Um, so I'm Virginia Highland. I'm a pre-sales consultant at Blackcart, uh, and I'm also your host for this afternoon's conversation. So in terms of the agenda, I'm going to give a quick introduction to all parties to today's chat. We'll also slowly let people filter in as I slowly introduce everyone uh, so that everyone uh, is able to uh, listen to the meat of the conversation with Catherine. Yeah, everyone's so punctual. punctual. <laughs> yeah, it's only one minute past the hour. Yeah, it's great. Um, cool. So um, in terms of how it will work, um, we'll take about 20 minutes to chat. Um, everyone will get to know you a little bit better. And then um, we'll leave about 10 minutes at the end for anyone in the audience to ask questions. So um, if anything sparks you as we go along, um, feel free to add questions to the chat. Um, or I'll also give you the opportunity if you want to raise your hand using the Zoom reactions. Um, at the end, Palu will unmute you um, and give you the opportunity to ask the question yourself. Sounds great. And if people want to either relabel themselves with their role in company or add that to the chat, um, I always find it interesting to know who's here and what their background is. So feel free to do that if you'd like. Awesome. Um, yeah. So. Uh, the reason why I'm here, <laughs> the chat is organized by WeCom, um, which is a community for women in e-commerce. Um, and it was built to share stories and um, mentorship opportunities and ideas just to really support uh, each other's growth um, and, and support each other's success in this space. So it was actually uh, sponsored by leadership at Blackheart, who just went out looking for just a similar community like that to engage with and um, to learn from. And when they couldn't find one, they decided to create one themselves. Blackheart, um, for those who aren't familiar, as the company I mentioned I work for, we power Try Before You Buy solutions that make it easier for you to shop online by bringing the in-store experience to your home. And then finally, Catherine, um, in the spirit of the WeCom community and shared learnings, um, Catherine's joining us today to share her expertise in all things e-commerce, career development, leadership. Uh, we'll see where the conversation goes. Uh, but before we get into it, I'll just give some background on Catherine. Um, so she brings many years of ex expertise. Um, she served as the COO at Shippo, um, managing and leading uh, many teams, including marketing, business development, product management, and more. Um, before that, she served as the chief business officer at Automatic, uh, which is a company that powers WordPress. And while she was there, she actually spearheaded the acquisition and, and integration of WooCommerce. Um, and then she has also spent time in product marketing at Facebook, being imperative to the launch of the ad tech business. So she's such on many different parts of the e-commerce space, uh, which is why we're so happy to have her today. Um, and now she runs her own advisory firm called Upswing Advisory, uh, which is focused on advising executives in a broad range of topics. So hopefully you'll get a sense for kind of what those things are as we go along, because it's a long list. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, happy to be here. Um, okay, great. So yeah, to kick things off, obviously, uh, Catherine, you've had so many roles um, in, in different spaces, but I'm, I'm wondering if we can kind of get you to narrow, um, narrow down your experience and share with us one defining moment you've had in your career, whether it's just something that really some a moment where you look back and you're like, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense or really set you on the right path. Uh, it's a great question. And I feel like there have been many defining moments. And given that the context of this particular conversation is around e-commerce, I figured that I might as well share one that has to do with how I got into e-commerce. And there's always a fair amount of chance, I think, that happens in our lives. And this was definitely not an exception. So I just joined Automatic, which is the company behind WordPress.com. And one of the things that we were 
interested in exploring was how we could tap into the e-commerce trend of, of tremendous growth. And we knew that our customers wanted more e-commerce capabilities than we were offering because we had a business plan that had a couple not so effective integrations, but at least they were there with companies like Gumroad, Equid, and Shopify. And you can tell that this was a long time ago. <laughs> and long story short, we decided that we wanted to really double down and offer um, not just an integration, but something truly best in class for our customers. And the question was how to do it. So we explored doing a joint venture with Shopify because of the various options on the market. We felt that was the most poised for growth. Um, for context, this was back in 2014. Mm -hmm. um, and we also considered buying a company ourselves that would bring the capability in-house. And at the time I joined, we already knew, so this was maybe in September of um, 2014, we already knew that um, e-commerce was going to be an important focus for us. And we also knew that WooCommerce was raising around. <laughs> so that was a good indicator that they might be on the market. And while Shopify in a joint venture was very interesting, ultimately it felt like e-commerce is going to be sufficiently important to our company that we didn't want to just leave it entirely um, in the hands of a partner. And we wanted to have more, more control over that experience for our customers and really own it ourselves. And so um, since our CEO had much more years of experience in the space than I did, I was coming in from, from the company then called Facebook. <laughs> which is not known for its e-commerce. It certainly has dabbled in e-commerce for, for years and years, but um, hasn't really taken off the way the advertising business has for, for Meta. Um, he, he started the negotiation and the negotiation was fairly focused on, on price point. And it turned out that we were not necessarily offering the best terms that WooCommerce could get. And the answer was no, a very simple no. And at this point, it's now December, and our CEO founder is going on a trip to Antarctica, of all places, mm -hmm. where he will be entirely offline, will not even have a feature phone. So he and I talked through um, how we might be able to resuscitate this deal. And since he was going to be fully offline, he basically gave me a budget and said, here is the amount that you can offer. Mm -hmm. that I, you know, that I could just basically pay without needing a, a sort of forward approval. We, I think we all know those adventurous CEOs. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And I got on the phone with the two co-founders and after a very long conversation, realized that actually the price point, while it's important to all of us, was not the most important factor for them in the decision of the future of their company. And what actually mattered most to them was um, an assurance around how we would shepherd their employees and how we would treat their developer ecosystem and their partners. And so I ended up being able to get them from a no to a yes with only offering about 10% of my allotted budget. Wow. And that was, that was ended up, <laughs> ended up being crazy. Uh, <laughs> the acquisition of WooCommerce. Now it certainly took a lot more time to get all the paperwork in order, but that was how we ended up bringing them into the fold. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I think especially being in sales, you always get caught up in that pricing conversation. So it's always great to hear a story where it's not really about um, the cost. It also makes me think of like Elon Musk and Twitter, and now he's going back <laughs> to purchase it again. So maybe uh, he could have uh, benefited from some of your negotiation skills back when he agreed to his original price. Yeah, you know, I'm fortunate in that my text messages were not made public. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I hope they would be maybe less embarrassing, but um, I don't even have access to them myself. But certainly as, yeah. as Elon under that kind of scrutiny, I don't know if you saw the Atlantic article, but that was a funny one over the weekend. <laughs> I, I don't know. I haven't read that one. I was reading some others this morning, but yeah, I can imagine your CEO wasn't wasn't offering a casual one to three billion dollars. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Great. So I guess, yeah, it's funny you talk about like 2014 and the acquisition of WooCommerce. I'm thinking about like, what was I even buying online back in 2014? And I think I was definitely more so in like the blogger era of just um, influencers and being influenced to buy makeup. Um, but I, I'm, I'm curious, like when you think about uh, 
what was exciting about getting into e-commerce? Like, what did you see um, as like the next kind of like exciting opportunity in that space then? And then what excites you about e-commerce now? Sure. Um, I feel that there are a lot of opportunities and companies can come in and win pieces of those. So just looking at it from a macro level, if you're setting up an e-commerce site as a merchant, you need a website building tool. And that's where something like WooCommerce or Shopify comes in. But you also need um, to be able to accept payments. You need to be able to generate leads and create awareness of what it is that you're selling. Um, if you have a physical product, you need to ship it. So there are these sort of core capabilities that don't necessarily apply to all e-commerce owners. Mm -hmm. um, payments applies to the vast majority, um, unless right. you're trying mm -hmm. to just, yeah, <laughs> payments mm -hmm. is, is right up there. So that's, that's one of the most important and generating awareness um, is, is, is also very high on the list. But after those two, um, and it feels like MailChimp has really dominated one space and Stripe has dominated the other. Um, there's still a fair amount of wide open space for solutions. And while there are lots of tools now and, and technologies that appeal to merchants to try to make their lives easier, um, which I think is really needed because merchants also, I mean, just running a small business is sufficient work that also figuring out all these other pieces of the technology stack um, is, uh, is can, can be a real pain point. But it felt that the shipping software space was really dominated by stamps.com. It's been now bought out by a private equity firm and it's rebranded as Octane, but it's ultimately the same technology that has been around for, for decades. And it's uh, it felt like if stamps was the winner and that technology had not been tremendously innovative, that there was an opportunity for other companies to come and challenge and win some of that space in a way that um, had perhaps already played out in some of the marketing or the payment side of things. And so that's how I ended up getting very interested in, in Shippo and ended up joining Shippo after I'd been at Automatic for close to six years. And then um, I ended up running the operations at Shippo, which included the, the sales, the marketing, the BD, customer support and success, product management, and HR. Awesome. Yeah, I think um, like some of that like acquisition and things, you can do a lot of that digitally, but it's like when you get to the shipping point of things where now you really have to do something in the physical world where um, e-commerce can get expensive uh, compared to brick and mortar, even though you don't have that retail overhead. Yeah, and what's quite exciting about um, some of the other areas, such as where Blackheart is playing, mm -hmm. is that payments has now been somewhat dominated by Stripe. There are these um, other aspects, like what Blackheart offers around try before you buy, that makes so much sense for increasing average cart value and for um, helping increase conversion rates for merchants. That I've been really excited to. Um, mm -hmm. uh, as, I, as you mentioned, I've I've been very excited to be serving on Blackheart's board. Um, as an independent. And so um, I feel like the space that you are playing in is, is one of the most exciting as well. So awesome. still, I'm delighted to be a part of it. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's there's definitely still a lot to be done in terms of the online shopping experience. A lot of merchants right now are good at getting customers to their site, but then it's like what the customer is kind of like at their whim to shop the site, however they shop. Like you use the search function, you click on a collections page and um, it's really up to you. So it'll be cool to see how um, the experience evolves to make it more like every click is like an enjoying, a joy, enjoyable um, thing to do. Yeah, for sure. Um, cool. Well, I did want to take some time um, because this is also talking, we're talking about women in e-commerce. I'm curious. Uh, it's It's obviously hard to generalize about the female experience, but for you, um, have you ever thought about, or how do you think that being a woman has impacted your career? Uh, just, I guess, more, more broadly, not just specifically in e-commerce. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I feel that certainly I was surprised when I graduated from college and got my first job, which um, was a, uh, a role as a consultant at McKinsey that, um, Things had changed perhaps 
since maybe the 1970s or 60s, less than I had thought. Um, and I remember just feeling like, huh, some of these, some of these things that I'm running into in the workplace, I thought that's what the whole, you know, feminist movement and women's lib movement um, had already taken care of for me. And these mm -hmm. things are, are still around. So that was a bit of a surprise. Um, I think, uh, I think there's just the reality that whenever you're a part of a group that um, is maybe a minority group or less encountered that you, and that's certainly true for women in tech, um, that, you know, you just, you run into some biases, you run into some, um, you know, people who just aren't, aren't used to it. And sometimes it can even work in your favor, to be completely honest. I have to admit that for some partnership negotiations, when I was automatic, there were occasionally these moments where, you know, I'd definitely I'd be the only woman in the room and the other side, maybe not, had not prepared as well as they could have done, which certainly left me, um, a significant advantage in the conversation. And I'll never know if that was because I was a woman or not, but I will take it. So, <laughs> so it's not always, it's not always bad. It's just a part of the experience. And as a white woman, I feel like there's a significant part of the experience that I have not had as mm -hmm. well. And so I just try to try to stay, stay humble and aware that, um, um, that there is, <laughs> there's much more to the experience of being um, in the workplace than what I have seen personally. But what I have seen personally has been somewhat eye-opening and, and interesting. And again, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just part of what it means to be a minority or the only person in the room who has long hair or, <laughs> mm -hmm. or whatever it ends up being. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And, and thanks for that. I think that was a really helpful reminder um, when I think about the times that I've had to advocate for myself, whether it's because I'm a woman or not, um, that there's like others who um, also need our support as well, um, who who are also experiencing um, that feeling of maybe being a little bit different in the workplace. I'll tell a fun story. Um, again, I think it's a positive one and it's somewhat amusing, but um negotiations to buy companies are just certainly that wasn't where even the majority of my time was spent while I was at Automatic, but um, there are these sort of memorable moments. And I was negotiating with a investor to buy a company. The founders had already decided that they wanted to join Automatic, but one of the investors had blocking rights and was asking for an exorbitant price that was just unreasonable. And given that we'd already agreed on business terms, it felt a bit silly to even be entertaining <laughs> this investor who um, who was essentially bluffing. But long story short, um, I was on vacation at the time that we had to close the deal, but I had all the context. So I just kept running the process. And I remember one time um, I'm at a cafe, I'm in Spain. It's my one vacation of the year. And I'm on the phone with him again. I've been on the phone with him every day of this vacation. And he is shouting so loudly into the phone that without even putting it on speaker, I can hear his voice just by putting my phone on, <laughs> on the <laughs> table. I can hear his voice projecting. And um, he was uh, accusing me of being emotional, which was pretty funny <laughs> um, because he's the one who is, uh, has such a raised voice that you can hear him three feet away <laughs> and at that point um and again you never know if it's because you're a woman or not but right. it just felt like this was ridiculous he should just agree to the deal and we should be done with this dance and so I told him that for every additional minute that we stayed on the phone my price was going to go down my <laughs> <laughs> the amount that we were willing to pay was actually going to go down that's amazing <laughs> and <I love> that. <laughs> we tested it out I brought it down by you know, I forget how much, maybe $10,000. It wasn't significant. Um, and then I said, okay, and I'm going to bring it down by another $10,000. <laughs> and then he got off the phone and we signed the deal the next day. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's amazing. I love that. I, I've, I've often joked with my friends that my price is going to go up if I um, work for a, a company led only by men or with like not enough diversity. I'm like, it's okay if you haven't figured out your diversity yet, but I'm just going to expect to be paid a little bit more. So I love that you said that. Um, speaking of negotiations, I'm actually curious um, 
when you, when you go into a negotiation or any difficult conversation, is there like, is there something you do to prepare ahead of time or like a mantra or anything like that, that, that you have that keeps you um, grounded or focused? Oh, for sure. I wouldn't say it's a mantra. It's usually a spreadsheet. So before going into, especially a complex negotiation, uh, buying a small company, I would not actually say is that complex. Um, There are usually maybe five or six factors that you're considering, but if you're negotiating a special relationship between WooCommerce and PayPal, or Stripe, for example, then you probably have 12 or 15 different Mm -hmm. levers that you're talking about from payment terms to what the coverage is going to look like in international parts of your relationship. So there's Western Europe that might be treated differently from Australia, New Zealand, APAC. And and so you end up having, and then how are you going to treat the users that predated the deal versus the ones that you acquire after the deal is in place? And there, so you end up with a very complex, um, situation where if you give on this, then you're going to expect more on that. And so usually there's a model in which I have an understanding in advance. And I've worked with my team to figure out where um, we get the most upside and where we're willing Mm -hmm. to give. And then also just keep track so that you know, (laughs) all right, how are we doing on every single dimension of this deal? So you're sitting there in the conversation, if it's over Zoom, even better, because then you actually have your notes right in front of you. Um, Sometimes it's better to be in person and sometimes there are advantages to being remote. And then you're actually just going through every single one of these and making sure that you know where you stand um, relative to your targets. And yeah, so I'd say there's a tremendous amount of preparation that tends to go into um, negotiations that um, kind of scale with the complexity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine trying to keep track of of where everything is set in real time too um, is exciting, but also takes a lot of practice and experience. One thing I wanted to share that I think is really um, <clears throat> relevant for not only talking about women, but women in the context of e-commerce is that um, based on the, it's been a few years now, but based on the last market research that I've done, it looks like the majority of merchants, SMB merchants that are doing e-commerce are actually women. And I think that that is an important thing to keep in mind because sometimes we can feel like we're um, in a minority group in terms of um, the representation in the room, um, in the boardroom, in the conference room, whatever it is. But actually we have so much in common with these these entrepreneurs, these merchants, and that's a beautiful and special thing. And it's also fun to recognize the brands who have seen some of them or tried some of them or um, understand what your merchants may be going through and that they may be single mothers with kids and well, I'm not single, um, I do have kids and that's a part of the experience that at least I have some sort of personal empathetic relationship with. Um, and I think that's a really nice thing to have and it can make us more effective if it's something that we tap into. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think especially in e-commerce, um, like women, mothers um, or whatever their experience is, they bring that to the products that they're ultimately selling. So. Um, it just makes it better for everyone when someone um, is creating something that they have firsthand experience with. Um, with that, I did want to give everyone an opportunity to ask any questions. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat, or you can click on the reactions at the bottom of Zoom and click raise hand, and then Blue will unmute you so you can ask yourself. Um, And maybe in the meantime, while we wait for uh, questions to trickle in, Catherine, um, do you want to tell us just a little bit about Upswing, what you're working on this week even, um, and what it's been like to start your own firm? Sure. It it is a little bit of a foray into the world of (laughs) being an entrepreneur Mm -hmm. and in some ways being the kind of entrepreneur that we're often talking about in the world of e-commerce while there's no physical product um, it is sort of a, a small business. It's not venture backed. It's not likely to to scale into something huge, um, but it's a lot of fun. And working with uh, startup CEOs and helping them with questions around scaling their operations and their revenue. We work on mostly go to market topics, such as how to grow your marketing spend while keeping the efficiency high, and how to hire your first sales reps and set targets for them. And it's, it's really all around um, how to scale businesses. And it's been mm-hmm. such a pleasure. I've been doing it for a, a bit less than a year. And 
uh, it's just delightful to get to meet so many different people and, and businesses and um, yeah. try to solve problems with them. So it looks it, like we have a question. Yes, we do. Um, could you suggest your favorite books or blogs that inspire you? Um, absolutely. I don't follow a lot of blogs on a regular basis, though. Um, I love it when my friends send me their favorites and, um, we'll, we'll read those articles or, um, or blogs. I would say that one of my favorite books in the business world is how to win friends and influence people. Uh, it sounds like such a <laughs> hackneyed <laughs> answer, but it is a classic for a reason. Um, particularly around partnership negotiations. I feel like that book has just so many gems in it and it's a great management book too. I think it's really useful advice for how to run a team and keep people motivated. And it's also just the advice in the book is just stuff that I think is good to do as a human. Um, so it's a great reminder about just how to be, you know, a kind, thoughtful, upstanding leader, mm -hmm. um, in addition to getting things done. Yeah. That's so interesting. Thanks for recommending that. I, I haven't finished reading it, but I would definitely reiterate that being a kind human is a skill that you can learn. Um, <laughs> and being someone who can elegantly manage those complex negotiations is also something that you can um, get better at. It's not, not a natural born talent all the time. Um, I have another question here. Um, uh, do you have any advice for women beginning work in male dominated industries? Yeah. Um, it depends on the industry. I think that some industries have come further than others. One of my friends actually works in, um, he lives in New York and produces Broadway shows. And it was really humbling to hear that while we've talked a lot about the experience of women in the workplace, in tech, or in banking, or in law firms, that, um, gosh, there's this really tricky dynamic where still in Broadway musical um, casting, there are incentives, as there were maybe 40 years ago, um, for... Um, people to be very on friendly terms with the casting directors. Wow. <laughs> and that's a hard thing to root out that this, this stuff is, is going to take a long time to change. And I think it's harder or easier depending on which industry you're in. And in some ways, the industries that we talk the most about, like tech, um, have some systemic aspects to them that make them easier to address. Um, for example, the trend of everyone working remotely makes it somewhat less likely to have issues of sexual harassment in the workplace. Now I'm saying it won't still, it will still happen. It can happen online <laughs> and it can happen at company meetups or in-person events. Um, but in some ways it's actually easier to manage um, in the technology industry than in some others. And so I think we should just um, know that this is, um, this is a process we shouldn't expect perfection, um, especially if it's your first job out of college or grad school. You probably don't have a lot of leverage in the workplace and it won't be perfect, <laughs> but it's getting better. And as soon as you become more senior and have more influence and can make your own rules and enforce them, that you will then be able to start changing the world a bit more than just participating in it. And so I think it. It's a tough, it's a tough experience that most women go through, but it is getting better and there are things that we can do and we can also continue to give back over the course of our careers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's a hard, it's definitely a hard question to answer. So thanks for your perspective. I think when I think about um, like myself, I think it's a balance between like, yeah, being inspired and motivated, even like to get to that next step so that you have um, more of that power and influence over your own career and your own experience. Um, and then, yeah, reaching out to, to others. I know I've been lucky that some of the women I've worked with have been some of the most uh, important mentors in my own career. Um, one quick question, and then we'll wrap up. Is there a woman in particular that inspires you the most? Hmm. 
my grandmother was a very special person and she actually grew up in an era where women were even more held back <laughs> than it's very easy to focus on how there are gaps between where we'd like to be today and where we are, but certainly we have come a long way. And she was born in, I want to say 1910 and wanted to go to college and was her class valedictorian, but it was a time when that wasn't what women did mm -hmm. and her father didn't let her, but she lived such an interesting life, read widely, um, had tremendous influence over her community. Um, started an orchestra like it's just she was just a really powerful force of nature and so um her can do you know just keep going eventually we'll get there attitude I think has been pretty powerful for me um throughout my life um she's since passed but um yeah she, her memory is still strong that's awesome. Well, I'm glad you got a chance to remember her today. I wish I could have heard her valedictorian speech. Um, okay, so that that is all the time that we have. Um, thank you, Catherine, so much for taking the time to share with us. Um, and thank you also to the audience, everyone who tuned in and for your thoughtful questions. Um, if you'd like to join uh, WeCom, our community, you can find us at wecom.blackheart.com um, or we'll send you an, e an email after this with more information. Um, yeah, I, I hope everyone takes a few moments after this call to just reflect on what we've learned. Um, Catherine, I'd love to hear so many more stories about negotiations um, and how they how they really went down. but. Um, thank you so much again for your time today and I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thank you for having me. No problem. All right. Goodbye, everyone. Take care. Thanks, everyone.